Thank you, Chu Chu, for the very kind introduction. It's uh, great to be here today. It's always a pleasure. I remember being here in 2010. Um, fantastic to see so many friendly faces. I would like to start by thanking my collaborators, uh, Veronica, Sasha, Anand Saber, and the, and the professors as well in the second row. So I'll tell you a story in three chapters today. Um, first, I'll um, talk to you a little bit about, about contraction theory, which is a stability theory uh, that is robust, that is computationally friendly and modular, um, that talks about well-behaved well dynamical systems and algorithms. And then I'll tell you a little bit about how to use these tools for control problems. And um, optimization-based controllers are, are very prominent in nowadays uh, control uh, uh, technology and science. So I'll, I'll show you a little bit of that. And then in the third part of my talk, I will uh, uh, the, the third chapter is I'll, I'll talk to you about neural networks, uh, uh, switching from uh, feed-forward architectures to, to recurrent, implicit, and, and, and generalized versions of that. So these are my three chapters. The, the second part, so chapter three is really composed of two pieces, so we'll get there. Um, some of the things I'll talk about are documented in my text. Um, I also have extensive tutorial slides on my website, YouTube slides, everything is freely downloadable. And I've submitted an exciting workshop uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Slotin, Jean-Jacques, uh, who hopefully be able to, to be with us uh, this, coming, this coming December. I do self-publication uh, print-on-demand in uh, the honor of Mark Twain's quote right there. I, I prefer to think of books as objects that live and, and, and develop as opposed to being, to being frozen in time. All right, so here we are. So that's the start. So let me start from as good a point as any. So th that's the matrix A with some eigenvalues uh, that I am drawing as you know, little blue X's there. And you may remember that the spectral radius is upper bounded by induced norm of a matrix. That's true for any norm. Hmm? And that helps you understand discrete time dynamics. What I'll talk about today is more on the continuous time of, 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 of things whereby, in fact, the spectral abscissa of your, of your matrix is upper bounded by a different operator, which is called the log norm, also referred to as matrix measure. And it turns out here in light gray, I put the, the comment that, in fact, the log norm is a lower bound on the induced norm. So there will be at least one example today I'll show where thinking in continuous time is advantages over thinking in discrete time. So when we are looking at continuous time dynamics, the log norm plays an important role. Hmm? It, it's very similar to the induced norm. It's different formulas. I'm not showing to you the details today. Essentially, if you are playing with, uh, with uh, dynamical systems in continuous time, then it turns out that you may want to be working at something, with something called uh, the log norm of your, uh, of your Jacobian. Hmm? So in other words, um, you are give, given a continuous time system, x dot equal to f of x. You, you define the maximum expansion rate for it, which I refer to as the one set Lipschitz constant. And it is computed by performing three operations in a row. First, you compute the Jacobian of your dynamics. Then you calculate the log norm of the Jacobian. And then you worry about the worst case uh, value that it takes, the largest value. When you're dealing with a scalar problem, that's as easy as looking at the largest value that the derivative can take. Hmm? But when you're, doing, when you're dealing with a vector value, the problem, so in larger dimensions, now you need to introduce a norm, and the norm on the, on the space gives you a, a log norm, right? <coughs> so for example, if you're playing with an affine dynamics, the one-sided Lipschitz constant is just equal to the log norm of the, of the matrix A that defines the dynamical system. Hmm? And then on this slide, there's another result, which is that these log norms having uh, requiring that they be upper bounded is the same as uh, certain algebraic inequalities holding true. For example, if you're using a two norm with a positive definite weight matrix P, then asking for the two log norm to be bounded by a number L is the same as asking for an LMI to be satisfied. Hmm? And if instead you're playing with the non-Euclidean norm, for example, the infinity norm, then it turns out that that becomes a linear program. Mm? So infinity norms, one norms for positive systems especially, are very are notoriously scalable to large-scale problems. Mm? So 
Uh, right. So um, it turns out that uh, when you have uh, the ability of calculating this, calculating this one side Lipschitz constant, if it is negative, then people change sign on it and call that called minus C. <coughs> the, the one side Lipschitz constant, C being the contraction rate, then it turns out that for, an, for a time invariant system without any inputs, then you, you know that the distance between any two trajectory decreases exponentially fast with rate C. And so what does the Banach contraction theorem tells you in continuous time? It tells you about the existence of an equilibrium point X star to which any trajectory converges hmm, with that rate. And it also comes with two Lyapunov functions, in some cases three, hmm, which I'm depicting here. And so um, this is something that you may recall from your, from your calculus courses as being a, a tool that is useful in general for analysis purposes. Now, <coughs> when instead you have a, a system that is subject to an input, as it often happens to be the case, maybe that's a disturbance, maybe it's, a, it's your control signal or whatever it may, it may be, the natural assumptions to, to work with are to ask that with respect to x, your dynamics is contracting, and with respect to the parameter, the dynamics is Lipschitz. So now you're playing with two constants, C being the contraction rate and L being the, the Lipschitz constant. It turns out that also in this case, two trajectories will converge to one another, but of course they will not become equal. There will remain a distance between the two of them. Hmm? And, and this is the, the incremental ISS property, which tells you that the distance between two trajectory is composed of a exponentially decaying transient and then you have to worry about, well, here I have two trajectory X and Y subject to different signals, theta, y, theta X and theta Y. So it depends upon the difference between the two. If the two are equal, the error would go to zero. If the two are different from zero, then the error converges to essentially L over C because one minus uh, E to the minus CT will exponentially decay as well, right? So, so essentially, uh, uh, you know, the, the long-term distance between the two trajectories L over C. L is the sensitivity of the dynamics to the parameter and C is the rate of contraction. Mm -hmm. So let me take a second, uh, let me take a second now. So if you are studying control theory and you design, you study Lyapunov functions, you don't typically get to such explicit results. Mm -hmm. For all epsilon there exists a delta or given a K function and a KL functions, I have some bounds. It's all very anonymous. Here it's very explicit. L over C is everything you need to worry about. So that's my first property. I'm going to show you several properties of contracting dynamics in the talk, and I will be showing you numerous examples. So what are dynamical systems that are contracting? Well, let me, let me mention simple ones today for, because of the limited time. So I'll talk about gradient descent flows. Hmm? and I will talk about neural network dynamics. So in reality, there is a long catalog of examples that have contractivity properties. If, if you ask me about it, I will show you Luray models and the LMI that, that comes along with that, feedback linearizable systems. People have written all sorts of papers on, on data-driven learned models which are contracting and so on and so forth. There are converse theorems. So, you, you, you know, uh, if you give me a system with an exponentially stable equilibrium point, it is known to be contracting uh, with respect to a metric and so on and so forth. So let me focus on the first example. Suppose you have a function uh, from Rn to the reals. Right? It's a scalar function. And I am interested in studying the, the gradient dynamics for it. Super simple. Hmm? So then if the function is strongly convex with the parameter mu, then my dynamics is strongly contracting with parameter with rate mu. Mm? So the convexity parameter is exactly the contraction rate. This is with respect to the two norm. So now you can start to ask me a question, what if I am contracting with respect to an infinity norm with rate mu? What does that mean about the convexity of the system? Mm? Now it turns out that actually I oversimplified it. This is not an implication. This is an if and only if. This is a known as Kaczorowski's theorem. It's a standard result in uh, optimization theory proved in the 60s. It's if and only if. If you have a scalar function f, um, the function is strongly convex if and only if 
minus its gradient is strongly contracting. Huh? So, so in fact, uh, whether you know that your system is contracting or not, maybe you can forget about it, but the structure is there. Hmm? It's there for you to use. There is no loss here. It's a lossless transcription here. And for those of you who are interested in discrete time systems, so today I will be mostly focusing on continuous time problems. Now you should say, Francesco, I want to do gradient descent when I'm doing machine learning, but I want to do that in discrete time. Well, who has a continuous time computer? Well, two things. First of all, maybe there are continuous time computers, for example, our brains. But, but even if you're interested in discrete time problems, it turns out this is an, here's another if and only if result. Your continuous time dynamics is contracting if and only if there exists a step size alpha such that the standard forward Euler discretization, the simplest you ever studied, is contracting in discrete time. Hmm? So uh, there is no loss for me to do a walking, uh, talking to you in, uh, in uh, uh, continuous time because, you know, under minimal assumptions, in fact, this, this also works. It turns out, I'll show you later, the optimal step size alpha that minimizes the contraction factor after you discretize depends upon the norm. Mm? So I'll show you some values for it. This is a classic result known, for example, in monotone operator theory uh, for with respect to the two norm. All right, I've shown to you, uh, I've shown to you what, uh, three properties. I've shown to you one example. Let me let me go to my first, uh, to my first, uh, the second chapter of my story today. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about optimization-based control. So there is a number of approaches in modern control theory and applications that have to do with parametric optimization problems. What's a parametric optimization problem? Well, you know, you measure the state of the system, you solve an optimization problem maybe model predictive or city horizon, and then you apply the control action. But that's a parametric problem because it depends upon the state. As you change the state, you have to recalculate, right? On the bottom left, there is a picture from a you know, well-established uh, toolbox uh, solving special classes of convex optimization problems hmm, for which, in fact, you can solve fully the parametric problem. More generally, it's hard to solve in closed form parametric problems in large dimensions, right? And so let me show you one application called online feedback optimization. Here on the right, I have a collection of applications of this theory of online feedback optimization. It's a simple, it's a simple setup. So it works like this. So if you have a parametric, if you have, sorry, if you have an, if there's no parameter, you just are trying to optimize a cost function E, then you maybe can, are able to write a contracting dynamics. I'll do it in continuous time. And you find your solution X star. Instead, if you have a parameter, well, two things happen. If you have a parameter, what happens? So if, if I have a parametric problem, right, then if E depends upon a parameter theta, then also the right-hand side of your dynamics depends upon a parameter, hmm? which now means that you're going to calculate, you cannot calculate a solution, you calculate a function, right, from theta to X star. If your parameter is time varying, for example, the state of your system is evolving, right, and you need to solve at each time, then what happens is that you have a, uh, a contracting dynamic subject to a time varying uh, signal. Hmm? So, um, and what happens is that your optimal solution itself is not a fun it's not a point, it's not, it's not a function of theta, it's a trajectory. Hmm? So at each point in time, there is an optimal solution that is changing. Hmm? So that optimal solution that is changing, that x star of theta of t, is not a solution of your contracting algorithm. It's not a solution, it's not a perfect solution in general, right? You're trying to track it. Hmm? So the fourth property I want to show to you today is the following. So suppose you have a time varying um, contracting dynamics. Let me make the same two assumptions I made before. Contractivity with respect to the state and Lipschitz dependence on the, on the parameter. Then what do we know? Well, here I have two trajectories. One is x of t, which is the solution of your algorithm, of your dynamical system. The other trajectory is x star of theta, which is the place where you would like to be at that you are trying to track. It turns out that, like before, there is an exponentially decaying term, which I'm not going to worry about. And then there is, well, of course, uh, of course, it depends on how quickly does your parameter change, right? If your parameter changes slowly, you'll probably be able to track the trajectory very accurately. If the disturbances and, and, and the control signal, tracking signal and so forth changes very rapidly, then you may accumulate a larger error. So here, 
the tracking error between where you're at and where you would like to be beside the exponentially decaying term uh, is linearly, well, it's upper bounded by the largest value that theta dot takes in the norm that you're playing with. And then beside this, again, e to the minus uh, ct, which goes to 1 very quickly, the, the upper bound is L over c square. Hmm? L over c square. Earlier we had L over c. Hmm? So this is very general. You have a solver, whatever solver it is. Hopefully it is a solver that has good properties. Hmm? How large is the tracking error? L is the sensitivity to the parameter. C squared of the denominator is the contraction rate hmm, for your continuous time system. So let me, let me now use this L over C squared in the context of, suppose you have designed a low level controller. Your plant is behaving quickly in a stable way. Let me also assume it's linear for now. So then imagine you are regulating input output pair UY. So you have a cost which is the combination of a function, you, you pay a price for the regulation signal u and you pay a price on the output y and of course uh, you know the output y is a function of the plant but the plant itself is subject to, to a disturbance signal right w maybe that you don't have direct access to perhaps. Hmm? Then because as I was mentioned to you too, this may be a large scale problem it may not be possible to write a, um, a full-time parametric solution in closed form, right? So then you maybe are in fact running the optimizer at the same time as the plant is being executed. So then how do you set this up? Well, look, it's very straightforward. You say, well, suppose I have a cost on you and let me suppose it is strongly convex. And then I have a cost that I pay on Y and I don't need that to be more than just convex. Subject to my input output relationship because I'm assuming it is stable and I sh uh, right now I'm assuming it's linear, from the two input signals, well, your control U and the disturbance W, the output depends in a linear way upon the two of them. Hmm? So you calculate the gradient of your, of your, of your cost function, right? Um, so this, this would be the, the, the function E, right? You calculate the gradient of E, that's your gradient controller. It just so happens to be the case there is a trick that happens, which has nothing to do with contraction theory, which is to say that that particular gradient ends up depending only on the output and not on the disturbance signal W. So this becomes implementable without having to measure W. And now what is your problem? Well, your problem, you have a strongly convex cost function of U affected by disturbance signal W. Well, then therefore, the, the rate at which you are tracking your your desire to control signal after a transient is of the form L over C square. C is the contraction rate for the solver, which is the same thing as the strong convexity parameter. And L here, I didn't calculate it. It depends upon this matrix is uh, uh, Y sub U, Y sub W, and the partial derivative of phi. Hmm? Things like that. So you, you immediately get this L over C square. It's very simple, very general, um, easy to remember as well. All right. Um, just on the plane, I was reading a paper on, um, on receding horizon games, differential games to be solved, and the analysis was based upon using Luray formulations. So uh, that's also a contracting system for which we have sharp results and so on and so forth. Let me switch from optimization-based control to neural networks. So in these two pictures, um, I'm illustrating, th these are borrowed uh, from, from uh, papers uh, listed there at the bottom, I'm illustrating the, the stark difference between some of the leading uh, feed-forward structures that are, that are dominating our discussions and instead how much more complex and rich and um, recurrent is, is the connectome of a biological entity such as C. elegans. So then you kind of wonder, you kind of wonder, and, and on top of that, on the left, you just do calculations from input to output. It's a static map. On the right, really, although I didn't write an ODE, it's really evolving with time. It's a dynamical system. So I'm just interested in understanding this transition, you know, from left to right. I'm interested in understanding the dynamics that regulates the systems. And, and in terms, not just the dynamics, but also, you know, the behavior is reproducible and robust in many cases in the face of you know, uncertain components and, 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 and you know, noise in the stimulus. Hmm? And, and, and how do you do learning in, this, in these models? All right, so let me first talk about machine learning applications. So let's talk about um, switching from 
So this is a canonical model of a feed-forward neural network, right, with, an, uh, with a readout map, to instead something that is more biologically believable at the very beginning. And it's a model where you give me a stimulus U, and then I am solving a recurrent, the equilibrium problem for a recurrent neural network. Hmm? The equilibrium equation for a recurrent neural network is referred to as an implicit neural network. So that's why here I have both names. Hmm? And as you look at that, the first question you may want to ask yourself is, well, does it even have a solution? Does it have two solutions? Does it have an infinite number of solutions? You know, how, by the way, why would I want to do this? How, do I, how am I going to train that synaptic matrix A? And so on and so forth. But these are all questions that, 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 can, all be, that can all be addressed. So before I continue, let me take a, just a slight detour. So the, the canonical model of a... Of a firing rate neural network is described by this particular differential equation. You, again, you have a stimulus U, you have a synaptic matrix A. Here I've removed the time scale, I've removed, I made it all homogeneous for simplicity, but it can be done more generally. This is a firing rate model. The cousin, there's a cousin of this called the Hopfield model, which I, I, I really kind of think it's not fully appropriate, but in any case, the activation function phi is typically diagonal, which, that, which means that it takes a vector in Rn, it gives you a vector in Rn, but it's calculated entry-wise. And each activation function, you know, perhaps satisfies an equation like that, 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 that it's non-decreasing, but it's also non-expansive. Hmm? So, so the derivatives between 0 and 1, the, arc, the hyperbolic tangent and ReLU are examples. ReLU is not differentiable, but you have, if you have a, a a finite number of, of, of points where you lose differentiability, that the theory works through. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. It's entirely fine. So, okay. So what did I want to do? I want, what I wanted to do is I wanted to study whether this model was well, well posed. Does it have a unique solution as a function of the stimulus? I want to understand. Also, I want to understand x star, the solution, as a function of you. What are the properties, right? Um, we did it earlier for the strongly convex problem. Now, there's nothing strongly convex here. This is a, this is a neural network, so. Now, that implicit neural network is the equilibrium equation for the recurrent neural network, the firing rate. And if you do the forward Euler discretization, now you get this discrete time neural network model. This is also widely studied. It's called the leaky uh, integrator neuron model. So standard in discrete time. And so contraction theory is really helpful because in one shot, it tells you all you want to know about all three problems. And so here, how it goes. So let me skip the condition for a second. But under just a single condition, I can tell you that the, the continuous time problem is infinitesimally strongly contracting. And I have an expression for the rate. The implicit model is well posed. And the Euler discretization is also contracting. And it also can tell you what is the optimal step size for, for that particular problem. So here I'm using, I switched from using the two norm to using the infinity norm. Hmm? I'm interested in doing the infinity norm. Um, the infinity norm has to do with the infinity log norm. I did not write a formula for it. But asking that the log norm be bounded by the number 1 is the same as what I've written in here, asking that essentially this is an easy to interpret the graph theoretical condition. It's basically saying the, for, each neuron, uh, for each neuron i, the sum of the incoming synaptic connections has to be upper bounded. Well, OK, so I have to take the absolute value of those edge weights. It could be positive or negative. I need to take absolute value. And then it's upper bounded by 1. Mm -hmm. Unless there is a negative self-weight, so basically you have some, some internal dissipation, in which case you have the ability to tolerate an even larger synaptic uh, uh, connection into the node. So there is a very clear graph theoretic interpretation. It's actually also generalizable to, uh, to networks of contracting systems, which I'll show in a few seconds. It's about <laughs> the interconnections being sufficiently weak compared with the, with the, with the contraction rate, the, the self-loops. We, we've done also some work on, on, on contractivity of neural network with respect to the two norm, but the resulting tests are not as easily interpretable. Now, okay, so in one shot with just one condition, you get these three properties. Actually, you get many more properties. I just don't have the time to review them right now. You get, you, you get an estimate for the, uh, for the Lipschitz constant, the sensitivity from input to state. 
you get, if you have, if your matrix, uh, if your synaptic matrix A is uncertain, maybe you quantize it or you eliminate some of the, some of the synapses, you get an upper bound on how much your fixed point <laughs> changes. You can handle uh, d delays in the signal. If you go back to the ODE, if instead of, you know, being a, a, a dynamical system without delays, you can add delays in the transmission of the signals and, and some of these conditions will still be written. So let me talk to you about this generalization to networks of, of, uh, of systems that are, that are interconnected. So let me make my, <laughs> by now, this is the third time you see these two assumptions, so they should, be become, should begin to become familiar. I am going to, okay, I have a network hmm? at each node xi, there is a signal coming in, which is x minus i, so that by minus i I mean to say every other agent whose index is not i, and I'm going to assume that each node is contracting with rate Ci. And um, the effect of node J on node I is a Lipschitz constant. Hmm? And I need to index it now. It has to be L sub Ij. It's the same as before. Now it depends upon which J is affecting your dynamics. Hmm? So um, it turns out that without a third assumption, the system is not necessarily contracting in general. It's easy to see that that gets violated, hmm, even in the linear case. The assumption is that you need, the, the assumptions you need is you take, you take these uh, Lipschitz constant, the contraction rate, the one-sided Lipschitz constant, and, and the interagent Lipschitz constant. So you put the negative ones on the diagonal, and then you put the Lipschitz constant on the off-diagonal. That, that matrix has a lot of structure. It's called the Metzler matrix. You can do Perron Frobenius for it, all sorts of properties. But if that matrix is Hurwitz, hmm, it has a dominant eigenvalue, which is on the strictly left half plane, then the gap between that eigenvalue and the imaginary axis, that's the rate of contraction for your system, for your interconnected system. Huh? So this is the spectral assista of that gain matrix. Huh? The absolute value, because the spectral assista is negative. Hmm. All right. So how do I use this? So for example, imagine that um, some of you may be familiar with this technique called reservoir computing. You feed in a sequence of inputs, you, um, um, you read the outputs, hmm? you do some training of the readout map, only thing that gets trained. And suppose you have structure in your reservoirs. You, you, have, a, you have a hierarchy of reservoirs, right? One after the other. And I'm going to do it in discrete time, just for fun, because I don't have any other examples in discrete time. So leaky integrator reservoirs. These are exactly the forward only discretization that I showed in the previous slide. But then, but then it's very simple. The interconnection here is, uh, is uh, upper um, diagonal. So Hurwitz depends, um, depends only upon the diagonal elements. The diagonal elements are the synaptic matrices AI of each node. And so you just ask for the log norm of each synaptic matrix to be less than 1. If that's the case, then you have a cascading structure. And in fact, then the condition I showed earlier works. Now, uh, one more thing, though. I need to. Um, uh, and and I, I'm not sure I was clear, but let me, let me re-emphasize it here. My Euler discretization is contracting for certain values of the step sizes, not for arbitrary values of the step sizes. Hmm? So for sufficiently small. Why do I say that? Because look at the trick here that I have managed to pull on you. So this is a discrete time system, and I am proving it is contracting, but I am not using induced norms. You would have imagined it's in discrete time. I should use induced norms. No, I have a sharper test, which depends upon the log norm. And the log norm is always lower or equal to the induced norm. So this is a sharper result than the one you would have obtained had you just take the uh, uh, supremum of the induced norm of the Jacobian. OK, now I'm going into the, the weeds of the details. But, but the point is that this is, this is uh, sh to the best of my knowledge, is sta state of the art. All right. I finished my first section of the third chapter. Mm? So I've shown to you two applications of contraction theory to machine learning models, the implicit model and the reservoir computing model. I didn't show you empirical results. I, we have papers in NeurIPS that do that. So I'm not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go into that. Let me now talk to you about biology because uh, uh, my good friend Leo is here. So I wanna make sure he has something to, to look forward to. And, and Jean-Jacques has also a lot of experience on, on biological neural networks. So, 
Suppose you have a firing rate model, the one exactly the same equation I have shown to you earlier. Um, the question that I have is, what, what is that network doing? What is it optimizing? What is its functionality? Is there a, a neuroscientist, some neuroscientists I've read, whose work I've read say, is there a no, can we think of a normative framework for neural circuits? A normative framework is like a top down, as opposed to let's just see what they do. Let's just, from a cost function, down. And on the right is a picture of, you know, there is a field in, in neuroscience of associative memory networks. Um, it's usually studied with hop field models. There's an energy function. The minima of the energy capture the memory that you are, uh, that you're trying to retrieve, hmm? that you're trying to learn first and retrieve later. And so that energy function there, um, if you look at the level sets in the, in the bottom image at the bottom has, has four equilibria that corresponds to different memories. So, and the idea in neuroscience is with these normative frameworks is that your, your neural dynamics is going down a gradient. It's a gradient descent, exactly the gradient of descent that I showed you 15 slides ago. Hmm? It's just a gradient descent. Gradient descent is great, but it doesn't always work. So let me show you, let me show you a problem. So these are two papers by Olshausen and Field uh, that describe how in biological neural networks, signals are sparsified. So you are presented with a rich image with, with a lot of different values of the pixels, let's say. And then there, there, there is biological evidence that in just a few steps, your, 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 uh, your optical nerve and, and, and whichever other biological components is capable of diminishing the dimension of the signal to a much smaller, uh, to, to a much smaller number. Hmm? So it's dimensionality reduction or sparsification of, of, of the signal. And the, the area in the brain is referred to as the visual area of primary V1, which, which achieves these uh, simplifications. Now, there is a dictionary of symbols, which is here on the left, right? So this is, this is the, the dictionary. You have a very rich input, and at the output, it's much sparser, right? And why? Because the dictionary is used to encode the information being transmitted, and you're able to transmit, uh, you know. This is the f it's related to the fields of compressed sensing, for those of you who are familiar with it. So, what is the basic mathematical setup that people have studied in, in compressed sensing in, in mathematics and signal processing to do this? Here's the problem. You have, a, you have a vector with m entries, and you have a dictionary that is over-redundant. And you hope to reconstruct the signal u with an output x, which Ostensibly, it's even bigger than you, but in reality, it's very sparse. So there is a third number. In this picture, there are three numbers. Let me just mention. So M, uh, oops, sorry. M is much less than the dictionary, but in the end, I want to be able to obtain a vector X, which is K sparse. By that, I mean to say that only K entry of X are non-zero. All the others are zero. Hmm? So basically, you start from, you, you receive a signal of dimension M, but uh, you use an over-redundant dictionary and you obtain an oversimplified representation. Hmm? Very few, very few non-zero values. Um, right, each of, the, each of the columns of the, of the dictionary matrix are elements, right? And you hope to reconstruct the input with just a few elements. Hmm? Hopefully very different from one another, these elements, right? So how is the mathematics, how does the mathematics, well, you hope to have u minus phi x be small, so you use a two norm for that, that's a reconstruction error, right, you want to minimize that, but you also want to have a very sparse uh, uh, output x. Hmm? So phi is the dictionary, and, and, and by the way, the inner product between phi i and phi j, that's a similarity between the two dictionary elements. The more similar they are, most likely you don't want to turn on both, both neurons, right? Each entry of x is a neuron in, in our analogy. All right, so let me clarify. There has been a lot of interest in solving problems of that form. Hmm? So what is that form? The form is a problem which has, which has a convex function 
and then it has a regularizer, hmm, a sum to it. And the regularizer is typically poorly behaved. It's, a, it's a cl a convex, closed, and proper. It could be unbounded. It's definitely non-differentiable. So there's a whole theory that, ha that tells you which regularizer are allowable, right? And in this theory that, I, that, that, I'm, that I'm skipping, right, typically algorithms are written in discrete time. But I've been advocating for you the interest in continuous time problems and as motivated by neuroscience. So let me introduce for you well, a tool and a new dynamical system. So the tool is, um, there is a general, there's a notion of generalized projection, which is referred to, referred to in optimization as proximal operator. Mm -hmm. The proximal operator of, a f of the regularizer G is itself the solution of a small optimization problem. Mm -hmm. But this optimization problem is nothing too complicated. For example, in the case of the one norm, the, the regularizer is, is the soft thresholding function. Hmm? Lambda of that, we put a la so the soft thresholding function is a function that looks like this, and so forth, right? So this proximal operator is nothing to worry about. There are, there are tables with solutions. There are chapters studying all of the possible properties of the proximal operator. Hmm? Um, it's, it's, you know, the first time you see it, you're not comfortable with it. It's, it's, think of it as a projection, a generalized version of it. And as I said to you, there are many, many algorithms that have been written having to do with, in discrete time, this proximal operator. But today I'm interested in showing to you something called the proximal gradient descent. This is a continuous time dynamical system. I, I, I studied this in a paper by Mihailo Jovanovic. Um, um, introducing this proximal gradient descent. So this is, it still has a gradient of the, of the well-behaved function f, right? This is the well-behaved function f. U, U is a parameter, it plays no role here, right? Um, but then it has, the, the regularizes appears through this proximal operator right there, right? So uh, um, what do we, what can we do about this proximal gradient, proximal descent? Well, if you cannot guess that I'm going to prove contractivity, well, then you haven't been paying attention to my seminar, right? Um, um, so he here's what we can prove. So, and here's what we, we mean. First of all, the, the right-hand side is well posed than Lipschitz, which, which is meaning, because if you're imagining a biological implementation, you, you probably don't want to do, deal with discontinuous right-hand side or really weird behaviors. This is very well behaved. The second thing, and this is well known in, uh, in uh, um, um, optimization theory, right? In fact, if you're, if you're looking for a point x star that minimizes f plus g, that's the same as finding an equilibrium of the proximal gradient dynamics. Hmm? So the equilibria are the same. So up until here, these two results were known, and now I'm giving to you new results. The new result is, the composite cost f plus g is not increasing along the flow. So this is really like a gradient descent. I was telling you in neuroscience, people believe that the energy diminishes. Well, here, the energy diminishes, where the energy is the sum of the smooth, well-behaved part and the regularizer. Hmm? So it's a generalized framework. You, you still are diminishing the energy. Hmm? And then finally, uh, this is the, the cute thing. If, if you start with a, if F, remember we're, we're minimizing a composite problem, F plus G. If F is quadratic and G is um, um, separable, so G of X is the sum of G1 plus G2 plus G3 of the various entries of X, then it turns out in fact that the proximal gradient ascent is the same as the firing rate model. So let me show you the two models because by now you may have forgotten them. They're on separate slides. This is my mistake. So this is one model, that's the proximal gradient ascent, and then the firing rate, you've seen it a couple of times, right? It's the model up there, right? And they look the same, there's a minus x plus phi is the active, so the activation function phi in neural networks is the proximal operator of the regularizer. And then inside phi, it's linear, ax plus bu, because I've assumed the cost function I was playing with was quadratic. If it's not quadratic, then you can write nonlinear versions of that. And I would imagine that one can talk about neuro, neuroscientific interpretation of that as well. Hmm? So back to my, list, to my list of properties, we've sort of been able to answer pretty much everything. 
And then finally, it's also nice to be able to say when is the system contracting. Hmm? Remember I had a property that was that in the infinity norm case, it was the infinity log norm of the synaptic matrix B less than one. Here we're giving a, a generalized version of that. Um, um, it looks at, uh, um, and th this is related to, 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 to Leo's work, uh, when the synaptic matrix is, so here we're, we're looking at optimization problems, uh, in which case the, the matrices that, that come about are always symmetric. Huh? So I'm playing with a symmetric matrix. If it's upper bounded by one, hmm, strictly, then my dynamics is infinitesimally contracting. <laughs> and if it is uh, weakly upper bounded by one, right, so now it is, uh, it is possibly equal to one, then it turns out that you don't have contractivity, you have a generalized property called non-expansiveness or weak contractivity. Hmm? What does that mean? That means that two trajectories, now the contraction rate C is zero, hmm? so two trajectories are guaranteed to remain at the same distance in an appropriate norm, which I'm not writing right now, in a certain norm, the non-distance, and now uh, there are conditions under which you can guarantee convergence. Right? Before I discuss the convergence property, let me uh, interpret for you. Let's play more with this interpretation that my proximal gradient descent is in fact a firing rate. It works like this. After you do all of the calculations, the activation function, as I was telling you, was going to be a soft thresholding map. There it is. Hmm? You have a standard dissipation term. And then after some calculation, very easy ones, you can see that the um, Synaptic matrix has a nice expression. Hmm? It has related to the dictionary of the problem. Hmm? It's related to the dictionary of the problem. In fact, if you play some more a little bit more, if you play with it a little bit more, you can see that for the ith neuron, right, you have this soft thresholding. I'm, I'm still using the same symbol. And inside there, you have a summation for all j different from i of minus phi i dot phi j xj mm, plus the stimulus. I'm going to come to the stimulus in a second. And so now, um, um, under additional conditions, which I'm not going to discuss right now, you can also ensure that the state of your system remains positive. Mm? So the neural activations xi are positive, and when they are positive or zero, then this term here is a very clear interpretation. Mm? Depending upon how similar the two elements i and j are, Activation in I plays an inhibitory effect on the activation at I. Hmm? So here I draw this picture where I am illustrating that that the there is a hidden layer in the middle. Well, okay, and then you have you have an output uh, uh, neural projection there. Um, uh, all the neurons inhibit each other, right? And the amount of inhibition is proportional to the similarity between the the dictionary elements that they correspond to. So that, that is a very, very nice and clear interpretation. And by the way, the, the stimulus, the way the stimulus appears, it's uh, phi, oops, phi i transpose u, which means that neuron i gets activated by the stimulus proportionally exactly to the similarity between the stimulus and the dictionary element. So the interpretation is very, is very clear. So now, now the question is, does this weakly contracting or non-expansive system converge, yes or no? So this is an interesting problem. Mm, you can do a little bit of, of control theory on this. Now, on the left, uh, we know, we, uh, we list the assumptions on the problem. I'm going to assume that the original problem has an equilibrium, the last of function is convex, and from compressed sensing, the dictionary matrix satisfies something called the isometry property. Mm. And now, these, now there are implications, or if and only if implications. So then I know that if I find an equilibrium, I'm minimizing lasso. The dynamics is weakly contracting. And, and when you have an equilibrium of a weakly contracting dynamics, hmm, and when you have the isometry property, that equilibrium is locally exponentially stable. So now you are in a situation where you have that trajectories don't separate from each other, the distance cannot increase, but you have locally some trajectories that converge to the equilibrium. And if you put the two together with a little bit of thinking and drawing pictures and thinking about segments and how they shrink, you can prove that in fact your, your equilibrium is globally stable, globally asymptotically stable. And with a little bit of extra t attention, you can even give an estimate on the time it takes to converge to a small neighborhood of the, of the equilibrium. Hmm? All right, so that's the end of my story.
Hmm? I have introduced for you uh, this theory of, of contraction, given you some basic elements. We've talked about one application in controls, and we talked about some application to machine learning, and finally this example in, uh, in neuroscience. So uh, these slides are available on my website right now. So if you download them, you can click on, on these links. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, so I did not invent contraction theory. The person who came up with it is right here with us, is Jean-Jacques. So well, well done, Jean-Jacques, thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, I have talked about parametric optimization, gradient controllers, implicit neural networks, deep reservoir computing, proximal gradient descent, and also the last example of competitive neural networks. These are references, so you can download and take a look at them right now. So this is my last slide. So what did I try to convince you of in the last, uh, in the last 50 minutes? Well, we have a, a theory, hmm, which, which is a stability theory, right? Um, it incorporates fixed point properties, right? You, sometimes you just, you just even don't know if your, I don't know, if you, does your power grid even has, even have a, a feasible solution, right? You, you have to worry about that. Does, if you pro, a, apply a stimulus to this recurrent neural network, does it even have a, a fixed point? Hmm? Um, and I didn't talk very much about metric spaces today. I just went straight into the case of a vector space with a norm. But of course, you can generalize this in countless ways. You know, there are there are norm, there are distances that are available on on the set of positive definite matrices, on the positive cone of uh, um, of uh, you know positive cones on Riemannian manifolds, on Hilbert spaces, on Banach spaces, and so on and so forth. It's a robust theory. I, I, it, it is computationally friendly, right? You get an expression for the step sizes, you get a bound on the error, and so on and so forth. It is modular. I, I forgot to add that there. I showed you the interconnection theorem. Hmm? I have shown to you the basic theory with five basic properties. We looked at five examples. We looked at some applications. My group, we're continuing to work on optimization-based control. And we're continuing to work on neural networks, stra straddling this line between, between uh, biological inspiration and machine learning. And um, the last thing I'd like to say is that I, I hope I've motivated you to, to search for contractivity properties, right? Um, to, uh, to, to design engineering systems to be contracting, hmm? to analyze them with, uh, with, uh, with Lipschitz constant, standard ones and one-sided. I remember once hearing a, a seminar by Steve Boyd telling us that convex optimization is, is everywhere. You just have to open your eyes for it and look for it. Um, and well, I've shown to you results, the Cacioresis theorem, it's if and only if the function is strongly contracting, st sorry, <laughs> strongly convex, if and only if the dynamics is strongly contracting. So if I may borrow a sentence from, from, uh, um, from Steve, uh, look for it because you may find it. And if you find it in just one test, you obtain a number, a large number of properties. I've shown to you five properties today, but there are many more that one can verify. And with that, it's exactly the end of the hour. Thank you for your attention. I'd be delighted to take any questions. Thank you.